accurately date and with which we are already familiar, and thus to be part of something big and historic. Now, even though repetition and a comforting unoriginality are a big part of this week, I want to try and weasel a lot of the deal here. Because you see, another part of the comforting ritual is speakers convincing themselves that they're being original. And that is what I'm going to do right now. So, I'll try to avoid the graduation speech deal by giving you not advice, but no advice at all. Or at least no advice that will do you any good beyond this week. The only advice I'm going to give you is A, about the next five days only, and B, in reality, a kind of anti-advice. So Gus, owned this guy, that was good. How long has that been out there? <laughs> <laughs> okay, good. All right, I want to talk about three things that I want you to just watch out for this week. And none of these things are bad, they're all good, but we want to keep them in the back of our head. They can imply things they don't mean. The first one is the drawing of big life lessons. So there are undoubtedly a lot of lessons to be learned from the events of this week, and there are lessons to be learned for sure from your last four years of high school. However, this might not be the week to try and learn those lessons. And the reason for that is very simple. We usually assess events by their outcomes, and we don't yet know the out what the outcome of your high school years is going to be. So allow me to indulge in the brief personal example. This is an optional part of the graduation speech that I made a slide, but it's pretty common. All right, and this is, this is a true story, which I'm sure you will not believe, but I have documentation. <laughs> the Saturday morning after I graduated high school, I was inducted as an officer cadet at the Royal Military College of Canada. <laughs> My teachers, my parents, other people's parents, none of them hesitated to draw lessons from those events. I was celebrated at graduation for the rather enormous scholarship I received. I was praised for my selfless choice of profession. And remember, this was just pre-September 11th, so I was universally lauded for a wise investment in a safe and stable future career. Suffice it to say, my career as an Army officer was brief. A few short weeks after my departure for basic training, I returned home in failure and considerable embarrassment. After a brief period of hiding out in my mom's basement, I began a long process of reinventing myself as the bookish, knit-tie-wearing graduate student you know and love. And I think I'm a much happier person for that reinvention. The point here is not that there weren't lessons to be drawn from the week of my high school graduation. The point is that the lessons people drew that week were largely the wrong lessons. What looked then like triumph was not, and what looked then like great decisions were in the end really, really bad decisions. You may or may not experience such a reversal of fortune this summer in the coming years, but either way, the lessons of this week will be indeterminate ones until you know how your life turns out years from now. There are a lot of lessons to be learned after four years at an institution as impressive and demanding and overawing as this one, but be on the lookout this week for final, easy conclusions. Mm. Okay, the second thing to be on the lookout for is claims about your collective future. Specifically, I want you to be wary this week of any claim that you are, quote, the leaders of tomorrow. <laughs> Now the statement is entirely correct, okay? A whole bunch of you are going to be presidents or senators or ambassadors to the United Nations, right? However, that sort of leadership is unlikely for all of you to achieve. And the danger with this phrase is that it will alienate the great majority of us who aren't going to be presidents and ambassadors and what else did I say? Senators. So when you hear that phrase, leaders of tomorrow, I want you to think carefully about what it really means, because it isn't a meaningless phrase. You will all be leaders in various ways, but take a minute and think about the context in which you will become a leader. You will be leaders of families, maybe leaders of students' unions or sororities. You will lead in offices and community associations and little kids' soccer leagues and all sorts of other things. There's no one model that will apply to any two of you, so think critically about what a phrase like leaders of tomorrow means for you. Then turn a similarly critical eye on any other prediction about your collective future. These predictions aren't meaningless, but they have specific meanings for you that are different than what they mean for the person sitting next to you. Okay, a third and final thing to be on the lookout for. Any and all demands that you follow your heart. 
So three weeks ago, uh, I'm going to butcher the name, Michelle Bachelet, former president of Chile and current United Nations Undersecretary for Women, gave a commencement speech at Columbia University, and she said this. I have just one thing to say to all of you who are graduating. Follow your passion. Do what you believe in. If you follow your own path, it is amazing where it will take you, end quote. Similar sentiments will undoubtedly be expressed here at HKS this week and all over the world this week. And it's not horrible advice. There are times in your life when you need to look deep inside and follow your heart. And we can all think of stirring moments in history when people have made lonely stands of conscience against the immoral demands of the crowd. The problem is that this isn't very good general advice. You see, most decisions are best made after gathering a lot of evidence particularly a lot of evidence about how other people in the same situation have behaved and what people you trust think you should do. So, for example, if you are bent on skipping university in order to pursue that career in professional wrestling and all your friends and relatives are telling you that that is a very bad decision, then in this case you should really, really not follow your heart. <laughs> The same goes for that girl you want to marry, but your whole family thinks she's a con artist. <laughs> and for your plan to hitchhike out to California instead of accepting the scholarship to Harvard Law. In these cases, and in a lot of others, you might end up following your own course, but you should begin by doing your homework. Listen carefully to what people you trust have to say, and then come to a reasonable conclusion. You might end up following your heart, but it's best to be skeptical about the idea that following your heart is an absolute principle. Slide. <laughs> so there it is. Three pieces of advice about other people's advice. Meta-advice. The inception of advice. <laughs> and with that out of the way, here ends my senior dinner speech. Those of you who know me know I don't like conclusions. I prefer an essay to just finish with its last point rather than spend time wrapping things up. Now, I usually justify my no-conclusion policy in kind of dense rhetorical terms about argumentative writing and the structure of an essay. There is, however, a hidden reason for my dislike of conclusions, one I don't often reveal. And that is that I just don't like endings. So I refuse to end with a proper ending. Instead, let me begin by kicking off a great week. And beyond this week, allow me the fiction of refusing to put a conclusion on your high school years. The worst part of teaching is that you don't get to see how the stories end. Students graduate with all this potential, and they go off into the world, and you don't find out what they made of themselves. So keep in touch. Let us back here in high school know what you're up to. Friend me on Facebook. I'll follow you on Twitter. And whatever you get up to, always be suspicious of clean endings.